So with the FAST exam of the thorax, we're often going to start at that subxiphoid site, which is common site with the FAST scan of the abdomen. So again, we trace the external landmarks being the ribs where they come together at the subxiphoid process. So we trace the ribs cranially where they join the subxiphoid. We part the fur. We apply alcohol at that site after we've parted the fur. And then what we're going to do is we are going to place our probe at that subxiphoid location. And when we do that, with the marker cranial towards the head, we'll see we get this classic longitudinal view of the liver, diaphragm, and what we're most interested in when we do our scan of the thorax with a fast scan is that area distal to the diaphragm. So we're looking at the pericardial and pleural space. In this image here, we see we've got mirror air artifact. So we're seeing the reflection of the liver in the far field on the distal side of the diaphragm. And that's actually a good thing to know when you're doing your scan here, because if you see mirror image artifact, it can only occur when there's air on the other side of the diaphragm. So it essentially rules out pleural effusion at this particular location. So what we're going to do to assess the area more, we're going to want to fan and move the probe around, and we're going to look at both pleural and pericardial. So there's no fluid at this pleural site. If we increase our depth to about 14 centimeters, then we're going to bring more of the thoracic cavity into view. So you can see we've shrunken down our abdominal component in the near field, and now we really start to pick up a nice view. And here you can see we've got the left ventricle and the right ventricle in this view. You see we got the papillary muscles there, we get the mitral valve in the near field of the left ventricle. And this is a really nice spot, again, to rule out pericardial effusion, because we can see the apex of the heart. We can see that there's no ring or black rim of fluid that goes around the apex of the left ventricle or separates the left ventricle from the diaphragm. So we've essentially ruled out pericardial effusion. And the other thing we do here is, if you get a nice image like we have in this patient, you compare the right ventricle to left ventricle size subjectively, and you can assess the mitral valve. So now we've got a good view of the mitral valve, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the root the ruled out pericardial effusion. And if we scan all the way off both sides, focusing between on the far field of the diaphragm, we see that we get mirror image artifact and no fluid in the pleural space. So this is a great view shared with the fast examination of the abdomen to assess the pleural and pericardial spaces. The next site we're going to look at in our fast scan of the thorax, we're going to look at the chest tube site. So the chest tube site essentially is where you put in the chest tube between the 7th and 9th intercostal spaces. And we want to, with a patient in lateral recumbency, we want to pick the spot where air is going to accumulate on the inside of the thorax, so that air pocket. So it's going to be sitting about here, a little bit more to the dorsal side of the patient when they're in lateral recumbency. So this is the chest tube site. Two ways to find that. You can count externally from the last rib forward to the 9th, 8th, 7th intercostal space. Or a shortcut that will actually get to that same spot is to trace your finger cranially where you get the subxiphoid and then move your finger dorsally. And if we look at that site there, the chest tube site, we'll apply alcohol again, we separate the fur. And when we do this, because we're looking at the pleural interface, so the interface between the lung and the inside lining of the thoracic wall, we're gonna wanna decrease the depth setting on our machine to about six centimeters, depending on the patient's size. So we're gonna decrease our depth to about six centimeters, and then we're gonna place our ultrasound probe on our patient at this location. So when we do this, you're going to see a classic orientation. You're going to actually see some rib shadowing. And then you're going to look for that first white line that occurs after the rib shadow. So that's going to be our parietal pleural interface. And what we're looking for there is the presence of a glitter or motion along that interface. So if I hold the pearl perfectly still here, what I'm looking for is along that line where we have the pleural and parietal viscera come together. We're looking for a shimmer. And so we can see that here, that there is actual speckling along that line between the ribs. If you have your probe too perpendicular, it's pretty white. What you want to do is just change the angle of your probe, so you see it's pretty white there. And just on that cranial rib now, you see motion at the cranial part of our image there. It's sort of a shimmering or glitter. That tells me that the pleural lines are sliding across each other and that we do not have a pneumothorax. So if I have my probe centered and I having trouble seeing that, sometimes I can put the probe over a rib, that'll oblique my angles, and therefore now I can see, and again, the proximal field, I see back and forth move, motion along that parietal pleural interface, and that tells me that I do not have a pneumothorax because I have the presence of a glide sign. So the absence of a glide sign tells me that I got pneumothorax. The other thing that you can find here is B lines, and we don't have any in this patient, 
But if we have B-lines, they do originate at the parietal pleural interface. And if we see those again, it tells us that we've ruled out pneumothorax because they only occur at the lung interface with the thoracic line. And at that site, if we have more than three in a particular view, then it indicates interstitial alveolar pathology. So again, here you can see we got a bit of back and forth motion. The other thing to keep in mind is you only see a glide sign when the patient breathes because it is the motion of the lung along the inside of the thoracic wall. So that's what we're looking for here. At the chest tube site, we're essentially looking for a glide sign in the presence of B-lines to rule in or rule out pneumothorax and or if there's significant B-lines in increased numbers in interstitial disease. So the next site we're going to look at on the fast examination of the thorax is the pericardial site. And this is essentially the fourth to sixth intercostal space over the site of the heart. You can either palpate for the most intense cardiac beat to locate the probe site where you're gonna place the probe to look for the pericardial window. You can also bring the elbow back and the site where the elbow is located is often a site where we're gonna find the heart or you can sculpt for the loudest heartbeat and place the probe there. So those are our external landmarks. Again, once we've got our landmarks, we're gonna apply alcohol. We'll separate the fur apply our alcohol, and then at that fourth to sixth intercostal space, we're gonna place our probe, and we're gonna move the probe until we find the heart. On the left peristernal view with this view here, what we're really trying to do is just rule out the presence of pleural fluid or pericardial effusion. We're not looking at too much detail in terms of cardiac contractility or abnormalities of the heart itself. We're gonna save that for the right peristernal view. But here you can see I've picked up the pericardial sac, the bright white line in the far field, and you do want to set your depth to ensure that you do have the entire heart in your image so that you don't mistake a chamber for free fluid. So in this case here, I can see I've got a left ventricle and a right ventricle. I got that bright white line in the far field telling me that that's the pericardial sac. And therefore, I have essentially ruled out pericardial fusion at this site. Again, the depth is important to make sure you zoom out to get that bright white pericardial sac in this left peristernal view. You can then, once you've got your cross section of the heart, you can turn the probe into a longitudinal view at this site as well. And when you do that, again, we can pick up the left ventricle and we can pick up the right ventricle. And we can get a subjective feel of contractility, but this view really is more to look for that far field, bright white pericardial sac as opposed to assessing true cardiac function. You will be fighting the lungs. As you can see in the near field, we've got some shadowing, so we've got a bit of lung overlying the heart, and you will be fighting ribs in some cases, especially on the short axis view as you get rib shadowing. So that's essentially our pericardial site for fluid around the heart and in the pleural space. Okay, so when we've completed the non-gravity evaluation of the fast thoracic scan at the pericardial chest tube and subzipoid sites, we want to look at the right side. So if our patient is in lateral recumbency, we want to turn our patient into sternal recumbency so that we can complete those right-sided, gravity-dependent initially, chest tube and pericardial sites. For the sake of this video, we're just going to turn our patient so we can show you where those sites are and what we're using for landmarks. So now our patient is turned into right lateral or we'll do this one in right sternal because we can, if our patient's unstable, do the entire scan in right sternal. So we're going to finish this T-FAST or FAST examination of the thorax in sternal recumbency. So again then, we're looking for that chest tube site. So we're going to start caudally and count to the ninth or ninth intercostal space. Or again, we'll trace the subzipoid cranially and come up until we are in the dorsal part of the thorax. When the patient's in sternal versus lateral recumbency, air is going to tend to accumulate more dorsally. So we're not necessarily going to go for the widest spot here. We're going to go more dorsal and caudal in that seventh and ninth intercostal space, more towards the ninth intercostal space at the chest tube site to look for the presence of pneumothorax. So again, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. So we're gonna start about here. We're gonna apply alcohol, separate the fur. And again, at this chest tube site, we're essentially looking for interstitial alveolar pathology as noted by increased number of B lines. One to three can be normal. And we're gonna look for a glide sign. So we simply place our probe perpendicular to the ribs, and again, we're going to want to zoom in uh, so that we're at about a six centimeter depth. So we're just going to zoom in to get a better view of that parietal pleural interface, which we see here. So we have rib shadowing, 
And again, at this site, we're just looking for a back and forth movement along that parietal pleural interface. And here we can see a really nice movement. There's a slight little bleb along the lung surface, which is normal and not significant, but it does help us identify that glide sign or back and forth movement along the pleural line. So again, if we see that motion when they're breathing, we've ruled out pneumothorax. If we see one or two vertical lines, V lines, then we know, again, that we don't have a pneumothorax, and that's normal finding. If we have increased B lines, then we're gonna be dealing with interstitial alveolar pathology, and that's when we have more than three in the same ultrasound window. So essentially, we place our probe perpendicular to the ribs, assess that parietal pro line for back and forth glide sign, rule in or rule out pneumothorax. Let's take a quick drive here, see if I can pick up. Okay, so that's our chest tube site on the right side of the patient in the sternal. So the fifth view of the fast scan of the thorax is going to involve the right parasternal view. And again, we're going to assess this area for pleural fluid. We're going to look at pericardial fluid. And we're also going to get a feel of cardiac function. So again, we look for the site where we have the strongest beat. Uh, or we auscult or move the elbow back to hit that fourth day at six into across the space. We generally start with our probe orientated in short axis so we can pick up the left ventricle and right ventricle as we can see in this view here. So this is essentially our mushroom view. You can see we got a bit of lung interfering but it gives us enough of a view to say that we can see the distal pericardial sac in white and we can make out the right ventricular free wall, the right ventricle, the ventricular septum and the left ventricle free wall. So we've essentially ruled out pericardial fusion, and we can also check between the heart and the body wall, as well as cranial and caudal heart for the presence of pleural effusion. So that's our short axis view, and if we get our short axis view in uh, right peristernal, we can actually move from the, what we call the mushroom view here, that we're catching between breaths, and we can slowly fan the probe up and move the probe up towards the dorsal aspect of our patient, and if our lungs don't get in the way, we'll be able to pick up the left atrial aortic ratios. We'll pause there for a second. So if you're doing the uh, right peristernal and you're finding difficulty getting the base of the heart, sometimes just because of the you want to be able to fan the probe up and you're going to hit the table, it's sometimes difficult to get that aortic uh, atrial window, which we can start to see coming in here as we move the probe from the mushroom view to the mitral valve or fish mouth view, and then we go a little bit more fan dorsally, we'll pick up the aorta and the atrium, but sometimes that's difficult and the probe will hit the table and you won't get the perfect view that you want. Here's not too bad, we can see the atrium and aorta here to subjectively say they're about a one-to-one -one size. We can have the dog stand up, and if the dog is standing, move the leg a little more cranial, and often in that position there, when they're standing, or you can put them in right parasternal with a cardiac table if you're real fancy, but usually in an emergency, this is all we're gonna do, pick up the mushroom view, and then we're gonna slowly fan the probe up. We're gonna pick up that mitral valve view, so you can see the fish mouth here where we got the valves in the view, and then we'll fan a little more, and it's right behind the rib here, but we can pick up the aorta and the atrium in that view right there. So again, this is subjective when we're doing an emergency scan just to see if we have congestive heart failure or we have volume overload where we're gonna compare that aorta to atrium. So the other big thing here though is you're looking for pericardial fusion. So if you start down low, you get comfortable with your apex view with the mushroom, you know you've got two chambers, right ventricle, left ventricle, any extra change is gonna be fluid. If you move proximally, you'll get comfortable looking at the fish mouth view, and then you'll also get comfortable looking at the atrium aortic ratio. So the other thing we'll do here is we'll turn the probe into longitudinal at this site. So again, to do that, we're gonna change from having the probe orientation and short axis with the probe pointed towards the elbow. We're gonna flip our probe 90 degrees and we're gonna pick up the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve. And in this site here, we can assess subjectively cardiac contractility, compare the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Again, look for that pericardial sac as a bright white line in the far field. Here we can see we're picking up the chordae tendine and the papillary muscle. We've got the left atrium there and it's moving a little bit now, but we've got the left atrium and 
Here again, we got a nice view of the left ventricle. A bit more, we're going to pick up the part of the left atrium. Oh, we've got some lung integrating here. So again, it's a quick view in the emergency situation just to make sure we don't have pericardial fusion and to get a subjective feel for left atrial aortic ratio as well as left atrial to radiative size and ventricular comparison.